Hello, it's Bruce Williams again. Today I'd like to present part three of my lecture on the selected gross pathology of laboratory rodents. Before we start, I want to thank my friends and colleagues who provided me the images over the years that allow me to put these together. And I also want to mention that yesterday, Dr. Crystal Pearl did a wonderful eight-hour presentation from Budapest, sponsored by C.L. Davis Foundation. And we were lucky enough to have our local hosts, Dr. Mira Mandoki and Dr. Ildiko Erdelli, record and webcast that particular seminar. It's a fantastic seminar. I've only had the opportunity to listen to about half, but I'm going to make time in my schedule today to listen to the rest of it. It is available on the Foundation YouTube channel. I want you to log in, look for the playlist that says Pathology of the Mice and Rats, 2018, La Pearl, and I want to watch that. I am in awe of my colleague. So, Krista, thank you so much for doing that for the Foundation. I really appreciate it. Okay, let's start with the uh, liver and pancreas of the mouse. Well, here is a mouse who has ictris. You can see that the pinna and the feet are yellow, the nose is yellow, and so we probably have to first think about what could cause ictris. And there are a couple of possibilities. We could either be dealing with severe hepatobiliary disease or with severe hemolysis. There are a couple of blood parasites that's probably worth knowing the name of <clears throat> in mice and rats, but generally in healthy mice with spleens, they don't cause much of a problem and probably will not result in such severe hemolysis. Uh, traditionally, epirethrozoan coccoides has been transmitted by lice, similar to what we see in pigs with epirethrozoan suis, the, the uh, two lice that are known to transmit epirethrozoan in mice are polyplax serrata and polyplax spinulosa. Uh, a second uh, blood parasite is Hemobartonella murus. Uh, it's, it's more severe in rats, um, but once again, often inapparent unless the animal has been splenectomized or the disease is potentiated by the presence of another blood parasite, perhaps epirethrozoan, uh, or certain viruses, uh, such as the lactate dehydrogenase virus or uh, mouse hepatitis virus. Um, one of the problems with uh, inapparent infections with hemobartonella is it will screw up the phagocytic responses and other phases of the immune response um, and will affect research in other ways. There is a uh, pyroplasm of mice as well, Babesia microti, but most of these won't cause this type of hemolytic anemia. I think when I'm looking at an animal with ictris, I would probably zone in or focus in on the liver. Um, and there are a number of, uh, uh, of conditions, both infectious and non-infectious, that may be severe enough to result in uh, hepatic failure. Obviously, you would want to check the, uh, the clinical pathology values for hepatocyte damage or biliary damage, including alanine aminotransferase, uh, LDH, alkaline phosphatase. And then we're going to look at a number of these agents. Uh, and causes, both infectious and non-infectious. I would not leave out uh, lymphoma. Um, lymphoma can often be overwhelming in multiple organs and result in hepatic failure, as well as other organ-specific damage. Uh, potentially <clears throat> important agents that I would think of in a case like this would be uh, mouse hepatitis virus, especially in immunodeficient mice, uh, Clostridium piliformi, Ectromelia, which is not a disease just of the skin, but also will cause splenic and liver damage. Uh, the host adapted uh, Salmonella, like Salmonella typhimurium. And Salmonella in rodents tends to be a septicemic disease rather than a diarrheal disease. And then uh, in immunodeficient mice, I would think about cytomegalovirus as well. Let's take a closer look at some of these particular agents. Here's an absolutely terrible looking liver, large confluent areas of necrosis. It is moth eaten, and we're looking at a nude or immunodeficient mouse. And one of the scourges in the early days of the development of the nude mouse was the polytropic 
mouse hepatitis virus, a coronavirus. This particular lesion isn't specific for that. I'm just going to use it as an example. Could be a lot of the other agents I just talked about as well. But it's a, uh, the, the coronavirus that causes mouse hepatitis virus in immunodeficient mice targets a wide range of cells, including hepatocytes, endothelium, cells in the bone marrow, lymphocytes, in multiple lymphoid organs, but some of the most profound lesions will be seen within the liver. So that's why it's called mouse hepatitis virus. This particular virus uh, will cause tremendous amounts of damage, not only in immunodeficient mice, but also in infant mice. It causes high mortality. The disease is called uh, lethal infectious virus of infant mice, or LIVM, or genetically susceptible mice which would include the BALPSIs and the DBAs. SJLs are considered very resistant to polytropic mouse coronavirus. These are heterotypic viruses with many strains, and immunity to one strain does not uh, give you immunity to another. It's contagious usually by the oral nasal route. Uh, it's inhaled, and it uh, uh, disseminates through a hematogenous form infecting uh, endothelium and parenchyma of a wide range of organs, including the brain, the liver, and the lymphoid organs. And uh, the infection in immunocompetent mice can be resolved within three to four weeks. But generally in immunodeficient mice, it results in progressively severe disease. Obviously, T cells and cell mediated immunity are important in the clearance of the virus. Because of the widespread necrosis in the liver, infected animals, especially young animals, will be runted and jaundiced, and there will be involution of all of the lymphoid organs, including the thymus. Other lesions you may see include ascites, a necrotizing enterocolitis with thin walled intestines filled with yellow watery digesta. A couple counterintuitive uh, lesions would be in older infected mice, you have actual mucosal proliferation of the ileocecal junction and the colon. And certain types of uh, immunodeficient mice, especially those deficient in interferon gamma, will develop a granulomatous inflammation in the abdominal cavity of the cirrhosis. The histologic histologic lesion in the uh, liver is spectacular with large areas of necrosis and the formation of large multinucleated syncytia, which often are uh, necrotic themselves and may be a little difficult to pick up, but when you look closely, you will see this and nothing else looks like the, uh, this form of mouse hepatitis virus. We'll conclude uh, on mouse hepatitis virus, but just by mentioning briefly the enterotropic strain, the other major strain, this is one that primarily affects the intestine with little dissemination to uh, other organs. You can, if you ever encounter this, see syncytia within the intestine as well. Okay, here is a liver slightly enlarged with multifocal coalescing areas of necrotizing hepatitis or hepatic necrosis. This can be a number of different agents, including Clostridium piliformi, the cause of agent of Tizer's disease, uh, any hot gram negative, which causes septicemia, which in mice could be salmonella, tularemia. Um, it could also be listeriosis, a septicemic condition, not too often seen in rodents, but if it does get into rodents, it will cause large areas of necrosis, which contain gram-positive bacilli in large numbers. And I want to include the bacteria Helicobacter, as well as the virus Ectromelia in this. But this is a picture of Tizer's disease, which is caused by Clostridium piliformi a gram-negative filamentous rod, which is part of the normal flora of many rodents. In most affected animal species, uh, infections will start in the GI tract, often the colon, 
and then as the colon becomes ulcerated, the portal uh, vasculature is infiltrated by these bacteria which shoot into the liver and they're very happy to release cytotoxins in the liver causing large areas of necrosis. And if this is not sufficient to uh, result in the death of the animal, then eventually it gets into the heart where it causes myocardial necrosis and that usually uh, shuts the curtains on the animal. In domestic species other than rodents, it is usually, the bacteria is usually ingested. It is not a normal inhabitant of the flora and usually exposure to rodents is suspected. This disease has been seen in a wide range of species but uh, is most closely associated with rodent disease and certain laboratory rodents such as gerbils and hamsters are exquisitely susceptible to this particular agent. In non-rodent species it's often associated with immunoincompetence and it's even been identified in HIV infected humans. When we think about Tizzer's disease in rodents, B6 mice are considered resistant to infection as compared to other strains such as CBAs and DBAs and B lymphocyte function appears to be particularly important in resistance to this disease. Infected rats may manifest with hepatic necrosis or may develop a characteristic megaloileitis, which we'll look at when we talk about uh, when we talk about rats. There are a lot of questions about the pathogenesis of Tizzer's disease because we cannot uh, grow this on any type of artificial media. And the disease was first identified in uh, 1916 by Dr. Edward Tizza of the NIH in his work with the Japanese waltzing mice. That's a little fun fact. The disease is well known as a problem in foals who probably pick up the, the uh, uh, bacterium as they eat the mother's feces, not uncommon in the young life of a foal and the necrotizing hepatitis that it demonstrates is absolutely massive and phenomenal. Intestinal lesions, interestingly, have never been identified in the horse as they've been identified in just about every other species. Histologically, you'll see large confluent areas of necrosis, and if you look very closely at the edges of the areas of necrosis in degenerating hepatocytes, you will see the presence of the filamentous bacteria in a haystack or haphazard formation. And the application of any type of silver stain will easily demonstrate the presence. In uh, uh, domestic species like the dog and the cat, you can also identify them in uh, uh, enterocytes as well as cells lining the mucosal epithelium of the colon with a, uh, a silver stain and usually you'll have a pretty prominent necrotizing enterocolitis in those species which will clue you into the possibility of Clostridium piliforme. One more severe necrotizing uh, hepatitis is multifocal and brings me to talk just a little bit about salmonella. It does not have to be salmonella, it could be any of the uh, hot gram negatives which very, <coughs> very characteristically will infect lymphoid tissue initially in the ileum, mesenteric lymph nodes, and spleen. But the lesion that you see when you open up these animals that will jump out at you is this necrotizing hepatitis as those agents go uh, into the portal system and attack the liver. The endotoxin results in damage not only to endothelium but hepatocytes and you'll have these areas of necrosis. Uh, unlike other domestic species, laboratory rodents, their salmonellosis tends to be solely a septicemic event with very little of the diarrheic disease that we so commonly see in, uh, in production animals like, like cattle and horses. So it's a septicemia. Initially there'll be necrosis of hepatocytes. Then over time, if the animal survives the septicemia, you'll have infiltration of the neutrophils to clean it up. And then ultimately, aggregates of macrophages will occupy these areas of necrosis. And these aggregates have over the years been given the name paratyphoid nodules. 
Over the years, the microbiologists have changed the names of all the Salmonella, and now the genus is composed of only two species, Salmonella enterica, or all the ones we're really interested in is, and Salmonella bongori. There are six subspecies of Salmonella, including Enterica, Salami Arizonae, Di Arizona Indica, and Hootenai, and underneath all of these we have the varieties, which are the classic ones that uh, we have grown up with, including Salmonella enterica, very variant Typhimurium, variant Teridus, variant Dublin, etc., etc., and I will shorten that just to say Salmonella Typhimurium. Salmonella and most other hot gram negatives. Uh, will infect the GI tract through the M cells and invade enterocytes. They are well provisioned with a wide range of virulence factors including uh, a type 3 secretion system which allows them to uh, be or which which causes the enterocyte to phagocytize this pathogen. And then they have uh, uh, fimbria which are important for colonization motility in the form of flagella um, and then of course the most important thing that all these have is the endotoxin which results in death of a wide range of cells most importantly uh, endothelial cells throughout the body one other thing that I will mention about salmonella and I often mention it when I talk about the other species is if salmonella is on your rule out list make sure that you culture the gallbladder it seems to be a concentrator in many species for Salmonella and a great place to get back a positive result. Okay, we've covered a lot of the infectious agents. Um, we're going to cover one more before we're done with the liver. Um, here's another one that you probably should not see in your laboratories. It means that a cat has probably um, gotten in or maybe the feed was contaminated with cat feces and we have flipped up the liver and adherent to the underside of liver embedded within the parenchyma and often free within or attached to the serosa within the abdomen are numerous cystocerca. These go by a number of names because the parasitologist for some reason decided to give separate names to the immature larval form, the cystocercus, and the adult form. The adult form of this tapeworm is a and the definitive host is Tinea teniaformis and or also known as Hydatigera teniaformis. Let's make it even more confusing. And the definitive host is a cat who will pass the tapeworm cysts when the uh, in the feces and if rodents get into that, the uh, hexcamp larva will migrate through the wall of the intestine and set up circularly around for a while, then set up shop within the peritoneum. Um, and occasionally within organs of the intestine where it is known as Cystocircus fascularis. Uh, interestingly, uh, in rats, Cystocircus fascularis, when present within the hepatic parenchyma, has been associated with the formation of hepatic sarcomas. When we talk about mice, um, very simple strains differ markedly in their resistance to their first infection with tinea, uh, with balbuses being very resistant, DVAs being relatively sensitive. An interesting uh, uh, lesion that is seen, and we've talked about it before in this particular in the lecture on the uh, GI tract, is uh, what happens in immunodeficient mice who are inoculated with tinea teniaformis. Uh, they develop uh, marked mucosal gastric hyperplasia, the mucous neck cells, with a concomitant parietal cell loss. It's not a really a specific finding for this. You can see uh, gastric mucosal hypertrophy with a range of other bacterial agents and even spontaneously. But uh, it has been diag uh, diagnosed in increased frequency in animals that are infected with this particular cesto. It's sort of tough to see what the uh, cysts are coming from, but these are uh, uh, large hepatic cysts. You can see small hepatic cysts uh, in mice associated with uh, uh, ductal plate malformations 
very common in a wide range of species, usually present at the edge of the lobes and usually don't cause much of a problem. They, um, they're a combination of uh, secondary and tertiary bile ductules which just aren't hooked up properly, uh, embedded in fibrous connective tissue, and then over time um, the epithelium will secrete material, they will get bigger, but they really don't cause much of a problem. Um, there are a number of mouse models which are associated with uh, polycystic kidney disease in which uh, cysts within the liver are also seen. Let's talk about uh, tumors in the liver. Uh, this is a mouse with a large neoplasm within the liver. The liver itself does not look that good. It is pale. There appear to be other neoplasms in this, and this is a case of histiocytic sarcoma. Obviously, uh, any tumor in the liver, you need to strongly consider lymphoma probably at the top of your list, and maybe number two and number three, maybe about 5% of these, maybe something else like histiocytic sarcoma, which we have talked about in the first lecture on the hematolymphatic system, but uh, it is commonly seen in mice and rats, often affects the liver, you may see a discranulopoiesis, and within this tumor, it's often closely associated in mice with the presence of extramedullary hematopoiesis, probably because some of the uh, cytokines that these neoplastic cells will secrete um, may attract uh, developing erythroid elements. The, uh, um, these particular neoplasms histologically can have a wide range of appearance. Um, they can, the tumor cells can be extremely pleomorphic, they can be spindled, um, and they often look a little different morphologically than lymphoma. Uh, not too many people do immuno on this, I, I, you certainly can, but uh, I would look at other tissues. I would certainly, if it's a female mouse, I would look in the uterus because there's a high incidence of histiocytic sarcoma within the uterus. And also, somewhat characteristically, I would look for, for the accumulation of brightly eosinophilic lysozyme droplets within the renal tubular epithelium, which is often seen in association, but not totally in association with this because mice and rats, especially male mice and rats, tend to produce a lot of protein. But if you can put the picture together with a large neoplasm in the liver with extramedullary hematopoiesis and uh, protein droplets, I think that that's pretty good evidence that you're dealing with histiocytic sarcoma and you're not going to confuse it with lymphoma. Well, here's an absolutely huge neoplasm. And if you want to call this a hepatoma or a hepatocellular carcinoma, I'm probably fine with either of these. I tend to harken back to the words of Dr. John Cullen, um, the world's expert on hepatocellular disease. And he doesn't make that much difference because hepatocellular carcinomas in most animal species rarely metastasize. They usually get to the point where they rupture and the animal bleeds out, even though they are cytologically malignant. I think that probably if you looked at this, you would find some areas that, that fulfill cytologic criteria of malignancy, including atypical mitotic figures, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so hepatocellular carcinoma certainly would be at the top of my list for this. Uh, common causes? Well, old age. Uh, old mice are going to get a range of tumors, and, and they do get, they go through a progression of hyperplastic nodules, foci of cellular alterations, benign, and uh, and eventually, if they live long enough, they will develop malignancies. We have traditionally given mice a lot of things to help them along the way, pro promoters and carcinogens, and uh, there's a wide range of carcinogens, uh, including diethyl nitrosamine, aflatoxin, carbon tetrachloride, um, and even manipulating diets to make them choline deficient, which seems to do a lot of things in mice. Um, and some, pro some drugs that um, cause an increase in peroxisomes. Some of the statins have been associated with the formation of hepatocellular tumors. Um, and then viral infections. Transgenic models that can express hepatitis B or C antigens um, or overexpress their oncogenes have been identified in, uh, in developing these tumors. Uh, of course, transgenic models are probably uh, are probably also utilized to make these tumors express themselves at a young age. 
And finally, for our last, uh, our last slide in this particular system, here is a mouse liver with multiple neoplasms within, some small, some large, some, if you took a look at them histologically, you would see everything along the spectrum from uh, hyperplasia to adenoma to carcinoma. And this is a type A mouse which has been infected with Helicobacter hepaticus. Helicobacter uh, hepaticus causes a very profound and, and interesting um, and I think characteristic uh, inflammatory change within the liver of most mice. Mice seem to be replete as well as other laboratory rodents with helicobacters. There's more and more that uh, tend to affect the liver and the bile ducts. And in A strain mice this has been uh, shown to induce a higher incidence or an earlier age of onset of hepatocellular tumors. A number of strains, including the Balpses, C3Hs, and of course the immunodeficient mice, are susceptible to infection by Helicobacter hepaticus. One of over 30 different uh, uh, strains have been identified in, or, or genera of Helicobacter that have been identified in uh, uh, mice. But only the AJ crosses, or strain A mice, have been. Uh, uh, identified as developing the hepatocellular tumors. Other lesions that you can see in other strains of mice that are infected with helicobacter, um, and we've mentioned a couple of these before, would be proliferative tiflocolitis, a cause of proliferative colitis, used to be uh, the province of Citrobacter freundii. Now we have a number of other agents, including helicobacter and atypical lactose fermenting E. coli that will do it. And then sequelae of that, including uh, various forms of inflammatory bowel disease and rectal prolapse. And of course, immunocompetent, or sorry, immunocompromised mice will show helicobacter disease at a much higher prevalence. Okay, let's move on to the endocrine system. I don't have a lot to say about the endocrine system. You know, of course, there are a lot of transgenic mouse models which now are, are programmed to develop endocrine tumors at a fairly high incidence, fairly high in life, and that may mimic various forms of multiple endocrine neoplasia. MEN, a syndrome of multiple endocrine neoplasia, is much more common in the rat on a spontaneous basis, but now that we can knock in or out these genes, we can make just about whatever we want. So from a spontaneous point of view, the most common endocrine tumor that we see in mice by far is going to be uh, tumors of the pituitary gland, particularly the pars distalis. We are very lucky um, in that pretty much all of the neoplasms of the pituitary in laboratory rodent species um, all the way up through non-human primates are going to be prolactin secreting and may result in mammary development uh, even mammary tumors, as in the case of, of rats, which will develop fibroadenomas, often in association with pituitary tumors. Um, they do tend not to cause a lot of clinical signs until they get to a very large size. I think when you have one that's this big, it's compressing the hypothalamus. This is one that grossly you might want to consider a pituitary carcinoma. Smaller ones not doing a lot of damage would be pituitary adenomas. And don't forget about microadenomas, which are ones that you can only see under the microscope. You won't see them grossly, but it is going to be an important finding in any study. So make sure that you always look at the pituitary gland. Uh, generally low incidence type tumors, um, they are uh, seen in up to 10% of B6 mice, very low in the Swiss mice, and uh, um, you can see them uh, in, in female mice, especially obese females that are fed estrogen or progesterone compounds. Okay. Another one that seems to be invading the bottom of the brain, so I'm going to go with the pituitary gland carcinoma in this particular case. And uh, this one is a uh, uh, thyroid carcinoma model. Um, as we said before, there are numerous 
uh, transgenic models. So this is a, a RET PC1 deficient transgenic mouse, which is a good model for uh, thyroid uh, papillary carcinoma. Okay, let's throw in one more system. And then next time we'll talk about the integumentary system by itself because there are a fair number of very interesting gross lesions associated with the skin of mice. Uh, when we talk about the uh, when we talk about the urinary system of mice, one of the classic lesions, which is common in older mice, and mice with lymphoma, don't forget the mouse with lymphoma, um, very common to see renal amyloidosis. Uh, pathogenesis is probably chronic inflammation with uh, macrophages producing uh, IL-1, TNF, and increasing the expression and production of uh, aposerum amyloid protein within the liver. So that gets into the tissues, it's degraded by macrophages, and AA amyloid will be put down in a number of different organs. Because I work with CD1 mice, a type of Swiss mouse, I see it all the time in these mice. But you may be lucky enough to work with a mouse strain where you don't see it very much. So it's very age and strain dependent. Here's a condition known as mouse urologic condition. You can see that the bladder is incredibly large and it fills up almost half or more of the abdominal cavity. And this is a form of obstructive uropathy, um, which is seen only in male mice because it's associated with the retention of the ejaculated coagulum in the urethra. Uh, laboratory rodents, uh, they have large uh, glands, accessory sex glands, including a coagulating gland, which um, gives their ejaculate a very sticky um, appearance to it which may have some uh, some evolutionary uh, benefit in preventing other males from impregnating females that they have already uh, tried to impregnate but unfortunately if this particular ejaculate does not get outside of the body and is retained it will cause obstruction of the urethra and then uh, the animal cannot void and will become uremic if you pay close attention to male mice you grossly may uh, observe paraphimosis um, because it's probably somewhat irritating and painful. They may uh, cause trauma to the penis um, resulting in an inflammatory balanopostitis. In male mouse it's still considered a uh, frequent cause of spontaneous mortality although better colony management and single housing of male mice number of colonies has been able to reduce its uh, incidence. Here's a condition which is seen in uh, increased frequency in C57 blacks. Uh, in some strains, you can have up to 10%, and this is hydronephrosis. Um, often due, and there's, there's nothing to say exactly what it's due to when you see it in an infected animal. If it's a female, a lot of times people will notice that the animal's getting bigger and bigger, and they'll suggest that uh, the animal's pregnant. When it still has a swollen abdomen at 45 or 50 days, you know that that's not going to be the case and often you'll find out that there has been obstruction of the urinary outflow. Um, you would think after years and years of evolution the kidney would figure out when it can't get rid of the urine but it's still there's no negative feedback within the kidney so 
Uh, hydronephrosis after obstruction will progress to destroy the medulla, eventually destroy the entire cortex, so all you're left is um, with this large bag of urine. And the kidney never knew it was supposed to turn off the, uh, the urine flow and use the other kidney. Uh, this can be due to a wide range of other spontaneous findings in, in non-C57 blacks, including uh, uh, uroliths, uh, neoplasms of the urogenital tract, anything that prevents urinary outflow, and especially uh, bacterial infections of the urinary tract. Another cause of greatly enlarged kidneys are going to be some of these spontaneous models of polycystic kidney disease. The autosomal recessive forms of this disease sort of mimic what we see in uh, other species, including uh, dogs and cats and, and man, um, where the autosomal recessive are the kidneys are absolutely huge, uh, almost at birth, just almost total defective formation and connection of these kidneys. Uh, possibly due to an associated uh, ureter misplacement defect, which has been documented well in humans. But the key to the autosomal recessive forms, which are the very severe forms, are the animals born with these huge kidneys. In the dominant forms, they often take uh, months to a year or two to manifest with the large kidney, the amount of fibrosis. But there's not a lot of fibrosis in these kidneys, but just huge dilated tubules and nothing really works. The animals usually succumb shortly after death. Uh, shortly after, uh, after birth, not death. Okay, uh, urolithiasis in, uh, in rodents. That's a, it's a real common thing. Uh, because we've already talked about the fact that male mice and male rats um, produce a lot of protein, and, and they're always secreting protein in the urine. It sort of acts as a nidus for urolith formation. Um, I don't usually keep track of all the different types. Um, the uh, oxalates, uh, triple phosphates, magnesium ammonium phosphates, cysteine, they've all been reported in various uh, uh, strains and obviously with uh, the transgenic mice now we can probably program some of these mice to produce just about any type of uh, urolith or crystalluria that we want. They're usually associated with some form of bacterial infection, probably just to decrease the outflow. Um, and are a frequent cause of obstructive uropathy and hydronephrosis. One thing to remember about rodents is they almost always have crystals in their urine. So the presence of crystals in the urine should be a normal finding, but obviously the presence of any type of stone or the, the amount of crystal that we see in the bladder in the upper left is going to be an abnormal finding. And when we talk about the, the, uh, uh, the entire syndrome, here's a mouse that has not only uroliths, but a bacterial infection resulting from Proteus mirabilis. And Proteus mirabilis is something that uh, I've seen a number of times in rodents. I tend to ignore it a lot in other species, but in rodents it is a pretty common cause of uh, various forms of urinary tract infections, including some large cases of pyelonephritis as seen here in rodents. So. I would pay a little more attention to Proteus mirabilis if you get it, but obviously you can you can pull a lot of different bacteria out of these particular animals. Okay, well that covers uh, a couple more systems in mice and rats. Hope you've enjoyed this lecture and it's been informative. I once again will uh, uh, advise you to log in to uh, Dr. LaPearl's uh, presentation on pathology of mice and rats. Uh, it's absolutely up to date, fantastic, and uh, I look forward to uh, putting out another lecture in a day or two on uh, the integumentary system of the mouse. Have a great day.